Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is uh, Henrik Schatzinger, and I'm the co-director of the Center for Politics and the People here at Ripon College. I welcome you to hear a very interesting story tonight. It is a story about collaboration among management, labor, and government coming together to save an important piece of the economy and community life in Northeast Wisconsin, a paper mill. For many years, the paper mill industry in our region provided employment for many families and stimulus for the local economy. In the early part of the 21st century, this industry began to falter due to what County Tom Nelson, an author of the book One Day Stronger, describes as, let me quote here, unfair foreign competition, overproduction, managerial failure to respond quickly to changing markets and technologies, and ever increasing pressures from Wall Street and the financial sector. When companies die, so do the communities that have grown around them. The book details how, through the cooperation of labor management and local government, Appleton Coated Paper Mill, now named Midwest Paper Group, was placed in receivership and then saved from being sold off for scrap metal. It, in the book's introduction, Nelson writes, the ingenuity of our legal and political strategy reflected a new three-part model of labor, management, and government working together to revitalize a troubled industry and to rekindle its potential, saving the kinds of jobs that helped build the American middle class in the first place. Tonight, we have three people who, have, who were instrumental in saving Appleton Coded and how it was done by using this three-part model. We will also hear them discuss what the learning experiences may be for other areas of, of American manufacturing today, facing similar pressures from both foreign and uh, domestic changes. Tom Nelson is serving his third term as Allegheny County Executive, which includes Appleton and the Fox Cities. He previously served three terms in the State Assembly from 2005 to 2011, including one term as Majority Leader, the youngest, by the way, in state history. He has a special interest uh, in economic development and labor issues, and uh, in particular, the pulp and paper industry. We also have here tonight uh, with us uh, attorney Sarah Geenan, who served in the United uh, Steel Workers Co-Council for the receivership case involving Appleton Code. She provided uh, Tom Nelson with very valuable advice on legal strategies to assist workers to save their mill. She is a partner at the premium law firm in Milwaukee and focuses her practice on labor law, bankruptcy, and employment law. She has given uh, lectures on employment discrimination and workplace harassment. And we also have here with us uh, attorney Tim Nixon, who gave uh, Tom Nelson the idea of objecting to the sale of Appleton Coded to a scrap dealer. Tom writes in the book that without Tim's encouragement to find another alternative, the story told in the book and tonight on this panel might never have happened. Tim is a shareholder at uh, Godfrey and Conn Law Firm in Green Bay and a commercial lawyer advising clients on bankruptcy and restructuring practice. He is a frequent lecturer on issues on cases involving commercial litigation and bankruptcy law. And finally, uh, with us tonight is uh, Soren Hauge. Uh, he is the Patricia Parker Francis Professor of the Economics and Business Department here at Ribbon College, and he will moderate the discussion. He has prepared several questions based on the description of the project of the, of the book, One Day Stronger, and those will guide the exchange among the panelists, maybe for about 40 to 45 minutes, before Soren will open it up uh, for um, a Q&A period with you for about half an hour. So, having said all of these uh, things, please join me in welcoming everyone on our panel tonight. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I'll 
give you an outline of the several areas of questions that I'll pose to the panelists, which follow to a large extent the narrative structure of One Day Stronger, um, Mr. Nelson's book, uh, about the case of Appleton Coded and its larger implications. Then I'll pose the first question in more detail, uh, let the panelists choose among themselves about uh, how to proceed. Perhaps Mr. Nelson could comment on the first question first, and then we could be a little bit more flexible about it after that. Um, and we'll try to keep each of the uh, individual responses relatively brief, maybe three to four minutes on average, to keep to the overall time limit, and then hopefully be able to go into more detail on some of the types of questions um, as we go along. So the, the four groups or areas of questions will relate to the main problems that Apple, the Appleton Coated Mill and the Fox Valley paper industry were facing during the period leading up to the receivership um, uh, hearings and, and proceedings in 2017. Uh, the second group of questions will relate to the potential immediate and concrete solutions that Appleton Coated uh, was uh, looking at, and other firms in the industry may have also been looking at in response to similar issues. Uh, third group of questions relate to obstacles to those uh, solutions being realized and the ways that those were overcome in this particular case. Uh, the uh, fourth group of questions will then relate to the broader lessons that this may have for public policy and politics and political leadership both in the industry in its present situation, also perhaps more broadly across other states and industries. So, uh, the first question is, from your perspective, uh, starting with Mr. Nelson, uh, what are the main problems that the Fox Valley paper industry and Appleton Coated in particular faced in the period leading up to its filing for receivership? Uh, and you may, at this point, note some of these problems that may still be uh, faced by the industry, but as I mentioned, we'll try to come back to those in more detail later on. So if you could please address that. Great. Uh, thank you, Professor. And thank you, everyone, for joining us, as well as Brickman College, for giving us the forum to talk about what I think is a pretty remarkable story. And so remarkable, I thought that I spent about two years researching and talking to people, interviewing about 70 people to learn about exactly what happened with Ampleton Coded. And then from that experience, to try to learn lessons and how they can be applied in similar situations and also in manufacturing in general. To so the problem that Appleton Coded had, I would put in two categories. The first was, I shouldn't say a failure, but there was lagging time for the company to keep up with changes in consumer, de in consumer demand and changes in the market. And so what had happened is Appleton Coated, like a lot of mills in the Fox Valley, make uh, printed paper, white braided paper. And in Green Bay, there's more of the tissue based. And Tim can talk about that too, because he's from Green Bay. But what's happened, though, is that there's not so much a demand for printed paper for a number of reasons. And so what Appleton Coated was working on with the help of Doug Osterberg, who was the then CEO and had been with the company for 35 years, he was trying to develop some brown rates that are component pieces for packaging, which of course are increasingly uh, more and more you know, uh, demand. If you look at the fundamental business model of, of uh, Amazon, it's basically a cardboard box on your front stoop. And so there was and there continues to be a big demand for that. What happened is that they weren't quite yet at the proof of concept in a way that they could start selling. They were probably a couple weeks away. And they had tried to tell the main investor, PNC Bank, which is one of the big banks, one of the largest banks in the country, um, tried to explain to them that we're changing our model, just give us some time. But what happened is that they were two months behind um, um, in their, I forgot exactly, in, in, their, in the numbers that they have to post. So there was a certain number that they had to post for each of those months, and they fell behind for two, uh, for two months. And so they gave PNC Bank the opportunity to effectively call the note. And by calling the note, they were forcing the company into receivership, and that's how the story began. We can talk about that later. But there's basically two categories. 
One, there was the failure to respond to changing market demands in, in, in a timely manner. The second was the role of finance and the current business model of how paper mills are run. Once upon a time, they were mom and pops, then they merged with larger conglomerates like Georgia Pacific or International Paper, and now by and large, a lot of them are owned by private equity firms. And so you have the role of finance in this country and how the financialization, when you look at paper mills, they're not making the kind of investments that they should be. So it's a combination of the, of the financial services industry, what they can do to other industries like, like, uh, like, like manufacturing, and then forward as well as changes in market demand. So those are two main problem areas. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll sum it up in one word, the internet. All right, um, you know, the demand for white paper just all of a sudden was going away. Um, who buys, I don't even know, do they put textbooks in books anymore? I don't even know, you know, I mean, are they all online yet? So that was one of the major problems was a substantive change in the way consumers used paper. Um, and the paper industry was slow to respond to that. And Tom pointed out, Green Bay, just let's differentiate the Fox Valley markets. Green Bay makes tissue paper, okay? Well, that's recession proof, okay? That's just, you know, you need to make tissue paper even in recessions. The other thing was that the change to it had brown paper, it's not just the cardboard boxes and the packing. Every time you go to Subway or McDonald's or Jimmy John's, that paper that wraps your food in, that's brown paper. That's what they call in the industry brown paper. And so a lot of mills were trying to change over from white paper to brown paper. Now let me tell you something about that, because I've represented several mills. That is apparently technologically really hard to do. Because I had some clients over the years that were amazing paper people. And we're trying to, but to do it, to get it to the proper quality that Subway, you know, pick whoever wanted it, even for experts in the paper field, was very, very hard. A lot of trial and error involved. And of course, it costs money to modify paper machines, right? You know, it costs millions of dollars. And Tom pointed out something else. If you're in this country and you are a lender, PNC, and while PNC may look like a bad person in the book, let me just draw the picture for you. PNC has only only one obligation, that's to its shareholders, to produce a profit for PNC Bank. That is the only obligation they have. They have no obligation to Appleton Code to do anything other than what's in the contract. All right? And at some point, they said, we have an obligation to our shareholders. We're going to get our money out. It legally doesn't matter to us what happens to Appleton coated paper. It's a very important point, and I can talk about this later. Different than what other countries do. Um, so I, I want to provide a little background. Now I grew up in Kukana. Um I spent my college years um, at this Appleton coated plant was on my running loop, my regular running loop. <laughs> I had family members who worked there, um, and more than that, I was you know I grew up in the union paper industry. My dad is referenced in the book, if you've read it. He was an international vice president of the United Steelworkers um, with responsibility for the paper bargaining division. So um, I had some familiarity with the industry, um, with this plant in particular. In fact, before Appleton Coated was spun off into its own entity, and when it was under the umbrella of Appleton Papers, I worked at the plant. I worked at Appleton, the sister plant, Appleton Papers. Um, I did training at the Appleton Coated location on, my, on the forklift, and I'll, I'll show you I don't drive a forklift any better, much better than I drive a car. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, so when, when Tim talks about the kind of changes that need to come in terms of um, switching gears, moving from this printed paper, first it was coated paper, which is the stuff that bubbles break the, the triplicate. So Appleton had moved from the triplicate, coated moved from the triplicate to advertising papers and other printed papers, and trying to move to this brown grade. But it, it requires significant capital investment. 
So even though Appleton was able to, uh, able, even though Appleton coded, was able to um, get their finances, their finances weren't that bad in the great scope of the insolvency world. <laughs> Uh, they, they weren't able to have that capital investment they needed to move it along. But this was deeply personal for me. Um, and, and I think, you know, one, one of the other areas we wanted to get into today is, is you know, the problems and, and, and looking at the problems beyond this plan. Um, from what I understand, having grown up in the paper world, pulp pricing was very volatile at the time, which was another contributing factor. Um, but more than that, um, one of the most significant concerns we had the entire time was that each job at a paper mill is equated with six to eight jobs in the community. Um, and, and that was really startling and significant when we looked at it. Um, you know, it, it, although we're talking about you know, the main problems that this plant had um, and, and the industry, it's looking at the kind of community dependency um, and, and the ripple effects that will come into play. Uh, so I, I think I've already skewed us a bit off topic toward kind of the next, the next some of the next concerns we're having, but um, I'll leave that out for now. Well, I'll take advantage of the segue to pose the second uh, set of questions then. Um, and whoever wants to jump in on this kind of thing, I can take, take that on to start. Uh, what were the main potential, immediate, and concrete solutions to the problems of Appleton Coded as a company and perhaps the industry if it had some things in common with that, at least helps uh, in Fox Valley as opposed to, say, Green Bay? Uh, in terms of changes in products, investment, resources, and so on. You've all addressed that a little bit, and it was addressed in the quotes from the book. What organizational and legal opportunities were available to put them into effect? And, and perhaps you know, the people who were focused on the legal part could follow up on that second question. I don't know who would like to take the first one. I love topics. Appleton Coded's paper the immediate problem was cash flow, all right? And very simple, you all understand this, right? You got a mortgage payment due on Friday, but your check doesn't come until next week, okay? That's a problem. And so they needed money. They were spending money at a rate PNC did not like, and PNC just simply said, we're cutting you off. We are freezing your accounts. We're not giving you any money. So, if you want to lock your doors, fine. Or your other choice is to go into receivership. So at least as far as Appleton coded paper, it was a cash flow problem that was the immediate issue, and it had to do with their financing, and it had to do with the amount of time it took to go to brown paper. And every industry I've ever been in, the management will always tell you they have orders coming. And they do. They just don't know whether the order is going to be there in a week, or a month, or six months. Um, so I think that was the immediate problem with Appleton Coded Paper. And then Tim, Tim touched on another point when PNC posed to Appleton Coded, you can either shut your doors or go into receivership. Um, th those aren't great choices. Now, first of all, if you're a paper company, they've got pulp literally in train, they've got pulp ordered in train cars, literally coming to the plant. That pulp will rot and go bad if, if it's not processed. Um, if they turn the equipment off, they lose the paper that's already on the rolls. Um, so there's there's paper that's being wound and produced. Um, and if, if, if the plant is not idled properly, the, the, you lose the product. So you, you lose millions of dollars worth of product. But then the other alternative is receivership, which um, is you could, uh, someone a define that Yeah, let me, let me do that. Right? that, that was gonna, I was going to... Um, point out the difference between receivership and bankruptcy. So when a company is insolvent, they, they, have, they don't have enough assets to pay their debts. Um, there are often two options. So in federal court, there's bankruptcy. Bankruptcy, there's, there's various different chapters, 7, 9, 11, and 13. 11 is the one we like to see companies in where they're, where they're seeking to reorganize. There's a process put in place. Um, a, United, a United States trustee is appointed, appointed from the Department of Justice to help oversee the process and the use of the company's assets. The company's assets, as soon as, as soon as the company files for bankruptcy, the assets are put in trust for the creditors. So the debtor, the company can still operate, but it's operating for the benefit of the creditors. And the United States trustee is in place to make sure that that happens. They can object, and, and the court and judge also oversee it. Now that's the federal level. 
State court receivership is the wild, wild west. There's not a lot of transparency. Um, all the property is vested in this receiver, who's just a lawyer, or a person. I don't even know if they need to be a lawyer, necessarily. I don't think they need to be a lawyer, either. Um, but that person is put in charge of operating, uh, of, of holding those assets for the benefit of all the creditors. Receivership is where companies go to die. Um, oftentimes, the receiver wants to get as much money as possible out of the company assets as quickly as possible, and then distribute it to creditors and just be done. Um, there is not a lot of rules about it, except for how money is distributed. And there's not a lot of transparency in the process. Um, so one of the immediate problems we had was with the receivership. Um, there's, there's not, it, it's, I was telling Tim before, it's fast and loose and dirty. Um, we don't, it, it can be hard to keep an eye on what's going on. Um, in this case, they had an auction one month after the case was filed. Now, if you know anything about the paper industry, um, or I should say pretty much just about any complicated mechanical or manufacturing industry, uh, manufacturing facility or entity, 30 days isn't enough to do due diligence to figure out if you're gonna buy the property and operate it. You need to know the books, you need to know the equipment, you need to do a property survey, you need to get title insurance, you need to do, you know, you need to look at years of the books, you need to look at the business plan going forward. What is the cost to convert the plant to something that would be operational and useful and, and successful in the future? Um, to get DNR and environmental surveys done, 30 days is not a lot. Um, but often that's what happens, this guy, that gets rushed through, and that was one of the immediate problems we saw. And as soon as this bankruptcy starts, it becomes what's in the best interest of the creditors. And that standard under state law is not particularly favorable to unions, um, although we had a collective bargaining agreement in our back pocket, which is governed by federal law, so state court can't run roughshod over the federal rules that govern our bargaining agreement. Um, and the best interest of the creditor standard was our other kind of, I would say it's our problem, but we turned it into our ace in the hole. <laughs> I think in some ways, the best interest of the creditors uh, by expanding it to consider, you know, the best interest of the creditors is usually dollars and cents, you know, the bottom line on the spreadsheet. But our goal was to expand that, um, and, and we can get into that a bit later, but uh, I think those were the immediate legal problems. So let me make a couple comments on, on what uh, Sarah talked about. Um, you can read my background in the book, so I'm extremely my mother worked for the steel workers union for almost 40 years, so that is my background. In the United States, insolvency, whether a state court receivership in front of a state court judge or in bankruptcy, it's show me the money, okay? The object is to maximize the value of the assets to pay back creditors as much as you can. And I, I don't see that being horribly different in bankruptcy or receivership, though you've got some special statutes for your, um, you know, your, your CPA and some of the other stuff in bankruptcy. But the law is very unforgiving, okay, in, in the sense of that, I always tell people it's the golden rule. He or she who has the gold makes the rules. So if you're Appleton coated paper, PNC, or, um, they could have gone into bankruptcy. PNC said, we are not going to give you any money to operate in a bankruptcy. Appleton Coated would have had to get money from somebody. Now, normally, that is their existing lender. But PNC, the value of their assets was about the value of their loan. So whether it shut down, or operated from an economic standpoint, PNC didn't care. So they couldn't get what we call better in possession finance, all right? Um, but PNC agreed to fund it for the sale process. Again, the employees don't matter in American insolvency law except for their specific rights as far as wages and some of the other things. The communities don't matter, it is strictly under American, I'm not commenting on that normatively, I am being descriptive for those of you who are political science. So there must be some political science people in here, right? That's a descriptive comment, okay? In America, insolvency bankruptcy is strictly about, except in this case, because of Sarah, 
the top, um, strictly about recovering the most money possible and paying it to the creditors. Now, I will tell you that America does a better job of recycling assets that are in financial distress. In fact, China and other countries have filed, it used to be GATT, I don't know what it is anymore, wherever the trade organizations are, but they have claimed the American bankruptcy code and bankruptcy process is an unfair trade practice. Okay, because for instance, General Motors is still out there yet, right? And they're saying, no, it should have died. Okay, but it recycles assets to somebody else. But it is brutal on the communities, on the employees. It's, it seems like we're, we're giving uh, quite a bit of attention so far to the, the obstacles and problems, and perhaps we could uh, maybe get a little bit more comment from Mr. Nelson about the ways in which these may be presented opportunities as well. Um, can, can you address that sort of thing, or can somebody chip in on that side of the Yeah, so, so as far as the opportunities, um, the opportunities really became uh, apparent to me through two conversations. The first one that I had with Tim, so you can talk in the last 15 minutes, he really knows his stuff. <laughs> and it was kind of fortuitous that um, we happened to have a lunch schedule like the Thursday before the sale. And then we schedule a couple times, and so Tim's a good friend, and we have lunch once or twice um, a year. And so there was a conversation at, in on Washington Street in Green Bay where we had tacos. And he had said to me, you know, there's a paper mill, one of your paper mills that's going down, which one, Appleton Coda, oh yeah, that's right. And basically laid it out, what we could do. And it was literally, not to be trite though, it really was, it was literally a back of the envelope plan. Back, back of the napkin. Back of the napkin, back of the napkin, I'm sorry. See, so you can see Sometimes that. Sometimes this tape is full of several of those, actually. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I know, I know. So you can see that, you know, I still haven't learned to bring my own paper or my book. Well, I may have come up with the idea in time, but Sarah carried it out in court. Let's be clear who, who carried the water. I mean, maybe I was strategy, but she was tactics. I mean, pretty clearly. So go ahead. So I had that conversation, and after that conversation, I thought, wow, we have a really cool plan here. We have an opportunity to save a mill. I mean, uh, at, at the time, I had been on public service for 14 years. I thought this could be like the capstone of public service, being able to save a paper mill, 600 jobs, $300 million worth of economic activity, on and on, supporting five non-paper jobs or each pay paper job. And I called up Sarah's dad at the time, who was the International Vice President for Pulp and Paper, the United Steelworkers. So he's basically the titular leader, the international leader, the international president of paper workers, who happens to be from Bacana, down the street, maybe a mile from where I grew up. And he had said, yeah, you know, you know, that's something that we have you know, thought about in the past, and we're not really sure, and so those are two um, two conversations, and then from there, the receivership happened, the shutdown, and then Sarah putting the case together. So Sarah's the one who wrote the case that that looked at okay, what are the problems that we have here, and she was able to you know, let her comment on it. But the one thing is that there was going to be a breach of contract with. The what's it called? The severance? The severance? No, no. The, the collective bargaining. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah, collective the successorship. The successorship clause, which means if you have a new owner, that the bargaining contract carries over to the new owner. And then there was the matter of 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 equity or equity in the sense that all of the proceeds from the sale was going to go to one creditor. And now to the workers who were owed about two million dollars worth of back um, um, back paying compensation, which will just get pennies on the dollar. And so that those are two arguments that Sarah made. And the judge at the time, who just won his election for the appeals court, Greg Gill, he needed to have something to hang his uh, to hang his hat on. Uh, what Tim had talked about, which is he's just like give me an argument. I'm I'm a judge. I need a good legal argument to save this mill because they two are constituents, look to office, and I need to save a paper mill as well. And so because Sarah was able to make such a strong and pointed argument, and she took care of a legal end, that's what 
basically gave ourselves a toehold, kept the door open, and kept us in core progressing to the ultimate decision to keep the mill going uh, from, the, from the then owner. And from there, we started running, we called back 300 people, et cetera. Let me comment on the difference between bankruptcy and the state court. Bankruptcy judges are appointed for 14 years terms by the circuit court. So nobody votes for them, right? And they're just somewhere else, OK? This case is in Outagamie County in front of a circuit court judge who has to run for election every six years and has to go to school, go to church, see them on the street, play baseball with the people that work. And Judge Gill was actually up for election the following year. OK. Now, this is one now, of those. Now, not to say that that was, he, he's actually, we lucked out incredibly well with a judge who's very community focused to begin with. But, but, <laughs> but there's a difference, OK? There's, the, and, and it's what Tom said, it's what I told Tom that they had to do, and Sarah figured out how to do it. He wants to keep this open, okay? Unlike a bankruptcy judge who's just gonna follow the law and do whatever. You have to, however, provide him with a legal basis to do it because he's a good judge. He's not gonna violate the law, okay? But if you can <laughs> get him there legally as to how to keep this thing open, that's what he's going to want to do. So Sarah's right, it's a bit of the Wild West, but it's what you and I were talking about beforehand. For creative lawyers, it provides opportunity. Right. Now, this equity argument that Tom mentioned, um, you know, our three arguments were um, the collective bargaining agreement, um, the interest of the creditors, um, 450 creditors who happen to be our members, union members, who are owed, you know, tens of thousands of dollars vacation each in some cases. And well, as well as considerations of equity. Uh, this equity argument is something that we make just about in every single bankruptcy case, a court case, you know, a bankruptcy or insolvency case that comes along. And it's hard for us to get the traction. But in this case, you know, it was, it was a confluence of circumstances that came together. And I'll tell you too, this is the first time I ever, this is the first, um, uh, this was the first time of two times that I ever worked with my father in any sort of insolvency case. Um, he's worked with lawyers from all across the country, but um, it is a little different too when your dad is uh, watching when you're up at your parents' house because uh, uh, your mom is watching your kids, and your dad says, "Sarah, you need to find a way to you need to find a way to save this. You need to do this." Says, oh, okay, well, um, thank you. I don't want to let you down. Um, and, and, and he says, "Well, it's not just letting me down. It's 450 employees. Thanks, Dad." Um, <laughs> It, it might be worth just uh, citing some of the statistics from the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation's uh, 2019 assessment of the economic contribution of the bulk paper and converting industry, converting is turning basic paper into paper products, um, about the impact of the industry. Uh, according to the, those statistics, uh, the industry as a whole generated $18 billion in economic output and employed over 30,000 workers in 2018. So across the state, this is a very big industry with large stakes for the community. Um, I'd like to, just keeping an eye on the clock, make a transition to uh, the next topic, which you've already been addressing quite a bit, in terms of what were the main obstacles to realizing the solutions of using the receivership procedure to reorient the financing towards the um, reinvestment in the mill. Um, so how were those obstacles overcome specifically in this case, above and beyond the legal arguments? What specifically was the role of political and economic cooperation among multiple groups of stakeholders in Appleton Code? I'll let them, they're gonna talk about legal, which is, you know, truly really made the decision. But what got us to that point, to be able to even do this, to have this happen, the big obstacle was the culture, was the state of the labor movement at the time. So this is 2017. There was Act 10, that was done in 2011, which basically eliminated public sector unions. There was what they call uh, the right to work legislation that made it difficult for unions to organize and stay organized. And so there were these series of setbacks in the labor movement. And that compounded by a number of mills that had closed up 
thousands of workers had lost their job. So, you know, I mean, there wasn't a lot of morale. I mean, a lot of people were resigned to that faith. The workers, a lot of the workers were, were, were resigned to that faith. Um, a number of people in the labor movement and a lot of people in the community. And unfortunately, it came to the point where people were just used to paper mills going down. And so it wasn't kind of getting the same attention and empathy and result. And so I think of all the things that happened, the big hurdle was to convince the workers, convince the community that we could save it, that this could be different, that we play our cards right, we have this opportunity, we find out what the legal opportunity is, how we can make this argument, a number of things come together, we could do the impossible, and we could actually save this mill. And that was the biggest obstacle. Well, the question was who goes first, right? I mean, who's going to charge into the machine guns first? All right. Um, that, you know, that, that's a different, but I, I, I talked to Tom, I said, Tom, you're the county executive of the Allegheny County. I said, you walk into court, you or your lawyer, or both of you, and you go, excuse me, Judge Gill. I am the county executive. This plant is central to our economic and social fiber of this county and should not lightly be turned into a scrap pile. All right? Now that was easy. We needed Sarah to figure out how to get that done. Okay, you know, but but somebody had to step up and go, Judge. No, somebody had to step in front of the. Remember that picture of the person standing in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square? Okay, somebody has to get out and stop. But somebody else, okay, somebody else. Now that the dramatic brave thing has been done, now you need somebody to put together the technical part of it. And, and that's what Sarah did. And we were having, uh, my client called me before, you know, they called me the day before, a couple days before everything was going to happen, and, and you know, we started trying to strategize ourselves, what needs to be done. And I think, you know, we, we were coming up both with a solution similar to what Tim had, and then I reached out to Tim, and he said, well, you know, <laughs> I agree, now figure out how to happen, make it happen. <laughs> I'm very good at that, telling somebody <laughs> else to do things. I, I, and uh, my partner, Fred Perillo, is, uh, is really uh, uh, brilliant, but he's also, um, uh, you know, he's, he, he, he said the same thing, you know, make it happen. Um, this is a, you know, winning on these equity grounds are pretty challenging, and in this case, particular challenges we had were that we had a short auction process. The auction was set for 30 days after the case was filed, and as I mentioned before, that's not enough time for a lot of people to do their, to, to do, to do their digging. Um, and uh, the, the company that was hired to market uh, Appleton Coated had no previous experience with paper, selling paper industry, marketing paper companies, um, particularly one with specialized products like Appleton Coated. Um, and what we learned um, from the day, uh, you know, and then I guess we're going to talk about other obstacles with the receiver himself who wanted cash dollars instead of, um, instead of following up on or extending the auction process to accommodate a couple of the inquiries he'd received from parties who were willing to come close, come really close to the offer that was made and continue operating. Um, but he wasn't willing to extend the process. Um, so, in the, so we walked into court on that first day, uh, and that was the situation. We, we were going to the scrap heap. Um, and 430 people were to be out their jobs and, and tens of thousands of dollars vacation. One thing that should be said is that to the steel workers, as, as well as a number of other unions, a good labor management partnership isn't one where the employees get everything they want. It's where the employees are, you know, uh, have a voice in the workplace, and that voice contributes to an, an operation that is going to be successful into the future. Now, we talked about these vacation dollars that people are owed, and that's part of it in part because employees gave up their vacation pay years earlier, or they deferred payment of some of those vacation obligations years earlier to allow this company to succeed. The employees invested into the company, you know, with their vacation dollars, essentially alone in its own in its own regard. So, you know, that was we faced a lot of interesting interesting um, dilemmas, but I think the receiver then ultimately proved to be the most <laughs> the, the the biggest obstacle. Well, the receiver is again stuck with the obligation to maximize the value, and there's a case in Wisconsin which I was involved in called P and P Paribas 
which I went through bank, by the way. Sorry about that. Um, but the Supreme Court said, again, the golden rule, he or she who has the gold makes the rules. If you're PNC Bank, it's your money. And that is the, um, that's the driving factor. Now, the good news is the receiver will do whatever the judge tells him to. Okay, very important point in receivership, okay? Which is why, why they had a chance to do this here. Um, and I just want to comment on one of Sarah's points. This is not directly related to Apple paper. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been working with troubled companies for 30 years. If you really want to know what's wrong with a company, a manufacturer, you walk out on the floor and talk to the employees. They will tell you exactly what is wrong. And you know, frequently, it's different than what the management told you. But it, it's one of my things. I walk out on the manufacturing floor and said, yeah, you've been here with, tell me what's, what's, what this place needs to do, what's going on, and you know, they're right. Poor scheduling, maintenance that leads to a lot of downtime, maintenance that's not being you know, done properly. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different things that come up, and, and I think that's important. One of the other things is that uh, receivership is often pro forma. Uh, I think we had a lot of these objections in court, but the receiver, is it, isn't this the case where he sent CJ? Yeah, he sent CJ. So a lot of times receivership is, you know, the, once we go into court, the judge just expects that if they go in with an offer, now, they hadn't shown us the actual sale agreement yet. The sale agreement had never been filed, and no one had had a chance to look at it. Uh, nevertheless, the receiver sent um, you know, one, of his, one of his other lawyers to handle the case. And uh, I, I think they didn't expect the giant wrench uh, we threw to, to, to gain the traction. I didn't I did. tip them off that the giant wrench was coming either. So. We filed a brief. We filed a brief. You but, you know, we, we, and my brief was very good. I, I really enjoyed writing. But uh, you know, the first brief was very good, and then I uh, spent the weekend writing the second one. And um, we made we made some headway. So so I think uh, the, the receiver showed up at second. I'm going to put in a plug for Sarah. And you might have learned this from the OJ Simpson trial. Good lawyers can really make a difference in the outcome. Okay, creative people who can think on their feet. And Sarah had some uh, interesting curveballs during the hearings, and she did a great job with them. You know, you, you know, as I said, I might have been a strategy, but she had to go in and actually make it work. Um, but it makes a difference who the lawyers are. It really does. And, and you're right. Who gets sent? Who does things? Who whatever? Yeah. Um, with an eye to making sure the audience can have time for, for its questions, can we sort of give a, a briefer summary of how the ultimate agreement was formed, or what form the ultimate agreement took, took in which multiple stakeholders contributed to a solution? And, and then perhaps we can... So during the hearing, during this first day of hearing, um, we were still fielding calls from people who were interested in performing partnerships to purchase the company. Um, and the steel workers were able to walk into court and say, listen, we've got this guy right now who will give us a little bit off, not, not the full purchase price, but a little less, to buy the company and operate it, and convert it so that it would be operational in the future. And that is hard for a judge to say, whoa, you know, it's hard for a judge at that point to, to, to steam through. We ended up realizing that the purchase, that, that the difference in, I think it was like $3 million difference in purchase price, but some of that was offset by what would be included in the sale, what wouldn't. So the judge gave us the weekend. Yeah, th that. it's important that you can't walk into an insolvency court and say, Judge, I have this really cool thing that's going to happen next week. Can't tell you what it is. But if you walk in with something, okay, and say, Judge, I have this alternative, okay, now, you, now you've got something to work with. And that's actually where that's where John came in, your dad. Yeah. And so what he did though is you had to have an alternative. In this case, an alternative was another way to show that you can run the mill. And run the mill from another investor. Because you had the buyer who wanted to scrap it, who was, you know, being dragged, you know, kicking and screaming. And you needed to either show the the buyer or to show the court that there was a way to do this, because that's what Judge Gill wanted to do. Yeah, Judge, Judge Gill just couldn't go, I just want the mill to stay open because it's a good thing, okay? Remember where I said he wants that to happen, but he's got to follow the law, okay? He just can't make it up as he goes along. 
But now, if he has two economic alternatives that are your business. So the, uh, the company in question was a small cap private equity company in Chicago called Big Shoulders. And Sarah's dad had, you know, he basically knew the whole circle of private equity investors and owners within the paper industry because something like this happens a lot. And so as an international vice president for paper, he's constantly running around the country trying to put up fires and trying to put these deals together. So the way that I think he explained to me is that he called out Chicago and said, Todd, you do that or that. Hey, Todd, we have an opportunity here. I think you can come in and buy this. And I know these guys. I know the company. I know the history. I think we can make it happen. So Todd comes up from Chicago. He lays it out. It's a very sound uh, proposal. And the judge looks, and he says he's convinced. The judge is convinced that this model can actually work, that this new investor, Big Shoulders Capital, has, uh, has um, shown me, has convinced me that there is a way to do this. But of course, what happened is Big Shoulders basically was high enough to drop. So they came up with the model, and the judge wanted to make sure that the integrity of the process was intact, and that the company that we follow through the steps, you know, follow the process, went to the sale, you know, one fair and square, that they would get the opportunity of first refusal. And so what they did is they adopted the proposal that Big Shoulders did, the judge accepted it, and then sent Todd back to the Whitney City. And he's actually, he actually has a pretty good, you know, I interviewed for the book too, and he's got a pretty good attitude about this, despite the fact that I think that Big Shoulders has made a lot of money over the years, so don't feel bad for them, okay? They're in this business. Sometimes you get the deal, sometimes you don't. I, I think uh, the, the end result was ultimately um, a, a kind of a transition services agreement where the, where the mill continued to be operated in an idle state to, to maintain the equipment and, and to uh, continue to produce, uh, I think, probably some pulp, I think, could uh, use up some product and fill some orders while a new business plan was put in place, and I believe they, uh, it was basically flipped over to Midwest Paper Group, um, which is what it is now. Uh, it was it was really a combined effort. I think um, the, the employees should not be the employees' contributions should not be understated. Um, they had to put up with a lot, and they lost uh, some of the recovery in the process. Um, and in fact, they're still waiting for a payout of what, the, what some of what they're owed. They did, they, did, they did give up some of the uh, benefits that they were owed in the process of the settlement. Or right, they gave up a, a portion of their claim uh, if necessary. So, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, um, one of the postscripts to this, and this is what really gets people fired up and gets me fired up too, is that Industrial Assets, which was the buyer, that had, had to be convinced that you could run the mill as a mill and make money and be profitable. They, you know, we spent time, we spent money to try to convince them, and finally they said, okay, I guess we'll do that. Well, two years later, they ended up selling Appleton Coated, and they cleared, just on the sale, they cleared minimum $80 million. $80 million, and not a nickel that went to the workers, and certainly not a nickel that went to Hockey Game Company. Well, you, you need to understand that the, the, the guy that owns industrial assets is about as sharp a businessman. I mean, sharp elbow. And I don't mean any, I mean, he's good. Um, and he can squeeze a nickel, and Thomas Jefferson will cry. Very good at what he does. Um, now, is that great for the workers in the community? Well, maybe not. But it, it, it's the way the system is structured right now. I mean, I think he did care, too, about looking like the bad guy. He didn't want to look like, like the bad guy. And my partner, Fred Carrillo, put him right in the position where he was going to. My partner, Fred, is brilliant in the courtroom. So I, 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 I like to stick the papers off, and he'll do the courtroom theatrics. So Sarah is of the next generation. I am of Fred's generation. So I did cases with Fred for years, but yeah. But Fred, was, you know, Fred, Fred put uh, the, the owner in a, in a position where he wasn't going to look good. Uh, he had the uh, lawyer, the, the buyer's lawyer, admitting that he was uh, that, that he was going to shut down the plant and scrap it. Um, 
and it did look good for him. It certainly made him very uncomfortable. But um, it was, it was, yeah. With, with an eye to, yeah. Well, with an eye to sort of transitioning to the last topic and leaving time for the audience's questions, it sounds like the results in many ways were good, at least for the investor, to some extent for the workers. They retained their jobs. They didn't lose very much of their originally promised benefits. The community retained the economic benefits of the company's operations, and it's a going concern today. Uh, what does this suggest about this as a model for dealing with some of the restructuring or transitions that uh, perhaps are still needed in parts of the paper industry, uh, which has experienced additional plant closures, uh, or at least threatened plant closures, not only in Fox Valley, but also in, in uh, Wisconsin Rapids, um, where the, uh, the large mill there has been shut down, and where various solutions to these problems have been either proposed, for example, a cooperative of the suppliers to the mill in Wisconsin Rapids has been proposed. Uh, I'm not sure what solutions were proposed for the Clearwater Mill in uh, it's either Fox Crossing or Nina and um, uh, Nina Papers. Uh, but can you comment on how this applies to those ongoing issues and whether there's a model there that we can follow and try to re revitalize these industries and our communities in the process? Well, I think the first thing you do is not to get, you know, not to have that problem in the first place. And if you can run a business and turn a profit, it's not going to go into receivership. It should. And so the only way that you can get to that point is if we start making, and I pound this in the last chapter, which ironically is, the book has 11 chapters, so chapter 11. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good uh, What I talk about is that we're, we aren't making the investments in the paper industry. People have written off the paper industry, so to speak, saying that this is a dinosaur. This is an industry that is long since aged past, and so this is a self-employed prophecy. Because people in the industry believe that, sometimes labor believes that, the community believes that, legislatures, Congress, the Senate believe that too, and so they're not putting the type of investment into this industry. In fact, at the time that this was happening, the governor at the time, Scott Walker, had cut in half the allocation from the state to invest in a paper um, uh, technology development program at Stevens Point. It's just insane. So the first thing we have to do is not to have a problem in the first place. And that means we have to invest in it. You have to have uh, your elected officials, you have to have the industry, you have to have everyone acknowledge that this is worth saving and to put their money where their mouth is. And along the timeline of the story, there is a parallel story, a subplot of Foxconn. And so Foxconn was, everyone knows about that, people know about Foxconn. Okay, three, four million dollars, Gary knows about it. And that happened at the same time. In fact, decisions with respect to Foxconn happened at the same time of Appleton Coding. It was going in the opposite direction. The Foxconn deal was going like this. Prospects for Appleton Coding were going like this. Money for Foxconn was going like this. And money from the state was going nowhere. Was there a no There was no, zero. There was no help whatsoever. We did it on our own. And so that's the Four million dollars would have done it. Three or four million would have would have done it, but uh, nope. So then as far as tools go, I just have one here. And the problem we're having right now, and this happened with Clearwater, and I think it happened with Nina Paper in the flats in Appleton, is the owner that is selling these facilities attaches a non-compete clause to it. And they're allowed to do it. And so by having a non-compete, that means that whoever buys it can't run the facility as it should. They cannot run it as a mill. They cannot make white paper. They cannot convert paper into a certain product. So you need to have legislation. You need to have a law that simply says you can't do it. And I would imagine that in Europe and other places, that would never happen. That they would look at this, that they would be community-minded, that they would make a collective decision to say, this is an industry worth saving. 
you can't do this. If someone wants to buy it and run it, which is the same thing we had at, uh, at the Kimberly Mill back in 2008, that's wrong. We have to stop it. Yeah, let's talk about something extremely important called rate of return. Okay, money is a fungible good that goes looking for the most money it can get for its use. All right, so let's take an example here because this happens frequently. Let's say it's a very, very large international paper company and they have a mill that's only making 2% profit. Okay, but they got mills that are making 15% profit. Well, even though that mill might be making money, providing jobs and important to a community, it gets shut down. Okay, because this is not providing the proper rate of return to the stockholders of the paper company. That is the way the paper company legally is supposed to look at it, by the way. Um, so you, you see that happening. So that is a particular problem in that industry. Um, and he's right. They also want to cut capacity, okay? They want to, if they think there's too much capacity, which means they don't think their profits are high enough, by the way. And profit's what they're supposed to do. They don't mean to be critical, it's what they're supposed to do. If they think there's too much capacity and they can eliminate a mill and therefore get more money in their other mills, perfectly happy to shut down a mill that is in a small town that is profitable, but it's not in their long-term interest to allow that to happen. So and I'll yeah. just add very quickly that I think the best, there's a, the best uh, you know, that this is industry-wide. It doesn't matter what, actually doesn't matter what industry it is. It's whether it's in the grocery industry or, or um, automotive or, or um, paper. Um, you know, I've represented labor clients in, a, in all of these, and it's recognizing that the industry's evolved um, and, and uh, you know, working with the workforce you know, workforce is often willing to be flexible in order to, you know, to some degree, but they want to make sure they've got a voice in the, in the workplace. And the best reorganizations with the best results have been places where the labor management relationship was good, uh, you know, where, where labor, you know, because labor often has the best information about what's going on in the plant, what's the problem with the operations, where are the operational shortage shortfalls. Um, and they also have the industry relationship. Um, now, John Hannon is not just my dad, but he also is probably, you know, I guess his successor, Leanne Foster. They know every player in the paper. Oh, he's not the EPP anymore? He retired. Retired. Jeez, I gotta get there. But they knew every single player in the industry, and they spent the, you know, they spent the entire weekend, you know, I shouldn't say just the weekend, but they spent the week leading up to the auction, too, contacting every player, saying, you know, did you know this is happening? Did you know they're selling the company? And some of them hadn't even heard, despite the fact that this plant had been, in theory, marketed. But it was, it was, you know, these best solid reorganizations are the ones where management goes to the union and says, help us. Can I go back to one point, Tom? They, so you've got, like, say, so I'm just pulling the numbers. So you've got 15 paper mills struggling with the same technological problem. Why isn't the state of Wisconsin using the universities or the centers to find an industry solution? <laughs> You know, I just, it, it, it boggles my mind. I mean, I get free enterprise, I get competition, I get all of that, but it seems to me when you have an industry like paper, which is so central to Wisconsin, they're all facing the same sort of technological issues. It seems to me like the state has an interest in using, you know, one of its most powerful gems, you know, it's, it's, it's universities, it's education system, it's to try and come up with things that benefit the entire industry. But, as he said, you know, we don't do that because, well, that costs taxes and we don't want to do that. So I'm hearing solutions, I'm sorry, lessons uh, from this experience that have to do with the role of the state in helping to fund common solutions to common problems, uh, a role of management union relations and the voice of unions in the governance process to help find solutions and contribute to them, and also some uh, perhaps concerns about the structure of the legal and financial system that tends to incentivize relatively short-term thinking. And I think with that, I'm going to ask for the audience to follow up, and I'm sure you'll have opportunities to add more comments about these kinds of lessons. I think uh, Professor Schatzinger has uh, the mic and can uh, maybe provide it around if we need it. I'll, I'll let 
the videographer let us know if that's necessary. So let's I take some questions from the audience now. I think it's okay for people to speak as is. If you can just kind of summarize the question very briefly for the for the viewers, that would be awesome. Yeah, from the mic. Mm -hmm. I'll try to do that. Thank you. Questions, thoughts, comments. You spoke at the beginning about Appleton and Coda's inability to change quickly with the internet coming. One of the things that Appleton Coda was previously was a leading supplier of carbonless forms. And the chemistry in carbonless forms was a big contributor to the Fox River cleanup. Can you comment on the legacy costs of that and how that may have affected Appleton Coda's position before this situation came about? The question is about the legacy costs of the previous uh, line of paper production of Appleton Coated, which involved PCBs, uh, which is uh, uh, was mentioned by Mr. Nelson earlier. But so, um, and uh, Olivia had told me that um, one of the reasons why she here, she's here besides the fact that it's a great book is you're interested in the environmental angle of the story. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. You know, we, oh, I'm Riley. Okay, what Riley had um, talked about the legacy costs of this, and yeah, I mean, there was the issue about PCBs, and Tim, who was probably closer to this, and I think that was one of the reasons why I ended up um, The way that that came about is there was a partnership between the combined locks mill and the Appleton, uh, the Appleton uh, paper. Mill. And so there was this relationship between the two and how they would make the stock and how they would convert it into carbonless paper. And what happened with that is the pieces of those papers, the scrap paper, there were these chemicals in carbonless paper, PCBs, that um, if they get into the food chain, that it can cause cancer, birth defects, and so forth. And so in 1996, they began uh, addressing this issue. And so it took about 25 years, about $1.2 billion to clean up the river. And the nice thing about that story, uh, one of the uh, staff from the regional EPA office considered this, you know, like the gem of his service. And he said that it was the best example of a partnership, partnership, between the local government, business, and labor to take on this gargantuan task, and that is to try to pull out or cap these, this, this very dangerous chemical. And what happened is, is the $1.2 billion, not a single cent came from the taxpayer. Everything came from the industry, from the insurance company, you know, whatever. So that was, um, yeah, it was a huge legacy it, cost. It but didn't storm. impact Appleton Coated Papers at this point because when there was a change of ownership in Appleton Coated Papers now and some of the other ones, the original owners, in order to sell the company, agreed to pay the cleanup costs. All right, so Carlton Appleton Coated didn't get stuck with that. The previous owners of the companies were on the hook in their insurers because Appleton Coated hasn't made that kind of paper for years. All right, and nobody with money and a brain is going to buy a company that has a billion dollars of liability for something it did years ago. So the previous owners of Appleton Coated were on the hook along with several other companies and their insurers. Dean, would you like to add anything? Or? I don't think there's anything I can add that's not duplicative, so. Okay, let's see, I hear from another audience member. Yes? This paper mill is still running, correct? I drive past it whenever I go to visit my parents every single time on purpose, and it is. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. My, and I'm not a business type person at all, but it seems to me that things change so fast in industry why aren't we investing in these types of manufacturers or industries to to keep keep 
things going and keep people employed, et cetera, et cetera. You want to run for office? <laughs> I, I'm too old. The question is why we aren't uh, investing more in, in industries as so many different changes necessitate investment. Because it's for the good of the communities. Well, have you looked at how much we're spending on general research and research for things in this country anymore? We're not spending anything. Okay, we have turned research over totally to the private sector. So even when universities do it, they're getting paid for somebody. We used to do some, the most general research in the world. And by the way, we have penicillin because somebody was studying moldy bread. Okay? <laughs> That's why we have penicillin. It wasn't like somebody said, oh, let me find the antibiotic. I was going to save a billion people's lives. No, we're studying bread mold. Okay, but again, we don't do that anymore. We don't do general research. We don't look ahead like that because a lot of that's public universities. Oh, that costs money. We don't like doing that. And I want to just talk about, and, and I think maybe, I just had a client who bought the old Verso paper mill in Duluth. Uh, and that was a combination of work between Verso, who I've been opposite of for years, my client, the city, the county, the state of Minnesota, there's, if you want, there maybe within the past month or two weeks, very large editorial in the Duluth News Tribune about why that worked because labor, business, foreign, current owners, state, county, everybody got together and made this work. Okay, it was sort of like Appleton coded, but, but the, a lot easier because they all kind of got there without having the struggles. So, if, and again, that's the old Versal Mill. It's in West Duluth. Um, my client bought it, and the editorials in the Duluth News Tribune talked to me about that combination of parties making this work. In the book, there's a reference to a former, uh, I'm not sure what it was called, uh, Center for. Uh, industry research that moved, I think, to Georgia. Um, uh, yeah, there was the, um, yeah, so what happened uh, a long time ago, there was the the uh, Institute for Paper Chemistry, and that was a, how that research, research institute was financed, is that there were contributions based on output of the various paper companies. It went into this and went into general research. And from that, they invented and, uh, and uh, developed the products that the area manufacturers would, would make. And what happened in 1991, you know, again, the people just gave up on the industry. They just believed, they thought that this is an old industry. They were chasing um, a different industry that, you know, they thought had more potential without leveraging the natural advantages they had, both in terms of natural resources, human capital, labor management relationships. We let that go, and when we let that go, yes, we lost you know, a research facility, but we also lost you know, a lot of confidence. You know, we kind of lost a resolve to develop this industry. It went to, the, and right. now I'm not sure, I think somewhere in, at, 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 at uh, Georgia Tech, it's merged into another department, and it doesn't even have the word paper. Another audience question? Um, there are a lot of, whole lot of questions like that. Do you feel that uh, U.S., how do I say, the U.S. culture in general, are we, how do we stack up versus other places in the world? Are we at certain disadvantages or advantages? Or how do we the question is about how U.S.'s culture in relation to this differs from other countries. Let me talk about it in terms of insolvency and bankruptcy law. Right. In the United States, currently, it's, it's he or she who has the gold makes the rules. Okay. It is total protection of the capital investment. Now, the reason for that is we want people to do capital investment, and we want them to be able to project their risk, and we want them to be able to price it so they keep investing money. That's really an important thing. However, there's other ways of doing it, okay? If you go to most of, well, let me use Europe as an example. 
um, is that it, you, you go to any of the European countries, you know, the communities, the workers have actual standing to stand up and go, excuse us, but, you know, this is really an important thing here. The downside of that is sometimes you know, you preserve horse and buggy whip manufacturers when you ought to be moving on to something else, okay? But I, I never viewed that as sort of like a really good argument. Let me give you an example. There is currently a law in the state of Wisconsin, Sarah, do you know the number off the top of your head? What's the uh, priming lien for employees? Is it 5,000? I was just going to mention that myself. 5,000? Uh, now I'm going to get confused myself. What's the number? No, I don't remember. Yeah. Is that I don't remember the numbers. Years ago, for years and years and years, that when, when these things shut down, if the employees were owed wages, they were out of luck. They just out of luck. Wisconsin passed a law, and it may be we're only the only one that was around. I helped write it with uh, with uh, uh, one of the assistant AGs. But if you're an employee, you can come ahead of the bank. Up to whatever the number is. There's three thousand. Thank you. Up to three thousand dollars for your wages. Okay. Now, to a person trying to pay their mortgage stuff, not having three thousand dollars. And who may have lost their job with no notice. Yep. So, so. Yeah. So they come ahead of the bank. Now, when that law went into effect, this was going to be the apocalypse in Wisconsin. No bank was ever going to lend another dollar to a Wisconsin business because the employees could get up to $3,000 each ahead of them in so, the pecking order. So what I was going to add is, if, if we're going to talk about culture, I think we're going to talk about culture, how it's reflected in laws and how those laws are enforced. Yep. Because when this law went into place, people were up in arms. Oh, it was, you know, like, all business in Wisconsin is going to shut down because they'll never be able to borrow another dollar. Then Scott, Walker's, uh, Scott Walker was in charge. Yeah. And um, the Department of Justice simply did, or, uh, and, and you know, for for the Department of Workforce Development, simply didn't enforce it. They just stopped enforcing we it. We did not enforce it. Um, but uh, under under Governor Evers, we've seen it enforced again. Um, and and when Governor Evers actually won his election, um, and, and in another receivership case, we heard a lot of creditors. A lot of the creditors called us and said, "Oh no, we can't loan money unless we talk about how we're going to do what we're going to do about this priming." And we said, well, we're willing to listen, but, you know, in, in most bankruptcy cases, members, workers get nothing. So, for, so, so I think we're talking about U.S. culture, it's very much about how it's reflected in our laws and how those laws are enforced. Yeah, the laws, these did not come down from the mountain. Nobody found them out somewhere. We have made policy choices that are reflected in law about who and what is important to us. If you look at our laws right now, the... What is important is protecting capital investment. I do not dispute that the protection and the encouragement of capital investment is a really big deal, and we need to do that. On the other hand, I don't know that having some laws like giving the employees up to $3,000 of the money they didn't get ahead of the bank, I don't know that that causes the economic apocalypse. Well, okay. they're still losing that much, at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, so we can do things differently. I think we have time for one more question. Right here. Um, if, say, the paper mill workers knew that they were not going to have, that they were going to have a, not really be paid um, for working during that time, time period between um, the... Um, when the case was filed? Court, the court period and stuff? Do you think that the paper uh, So that's one provide. thing that the court does, that the laws do provide, and uh, that's my 11 year old son who's never expressed interest in anything mom does. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there is, um, the laws do provide that, um, we call them expenses of administration. So one of the things the courts are supposed to do is, as soon as a case starts, the wages that the employee earns to continue operating the plant during the bankruptcy or during the receivership are expenses of administration. They're expenses necessary to um, protect the investment, protect the assets. So they're incurred in the best interest of creditors. So those are guaranteed. Oh, they're but, guaranteed if there's money to pay well, them, but yes. Well, that's so, generally true, yes. That's, that's true, and, and that's why, you know, I, I would say, you know, I'm always going to make a plug for organizing. 
But uh, union workers are better protected because you know bankruptcy lawyers cost money, even if you're the union trying to fight for workers' money. Yeah, and that's and I know it's the last question though, very good question. But there's two things. There's also a point where it's not legal to be working anymore when it goes into there's there's a certain point. So at some point the workers could not do it. It was not legal to do it. Yeah, but you cannot let workers work when it knows it can't pay them. Okay, that's just makes sense. It's so, fact. so banks will usually so in a case like that a lot of times the banks will begrud begrudgingly begrudgingly provide financing for just up to the amount to cover those wages to keep the available value of the assets deteriorating. But there are a lot of calls between lawyers working out, you know, how we're gonna finance twenty five thousand dollars for a week's worth of work or something, you know, a weekly on a weekly basis or whatever it might be. So one of the last morals of this is this would not have happened. This would not have happened if there wasn't a union that happened to code because the way that this had to happen is you had to have standing, which means that you were affected by this. And if you were affected by the receivership, by the sale, you had an opportunity to object. I had an opportunity to object, or at least that was an argument I made, because I had at stake the jobs of 600 constituents. Sarah argued that you had, you know, you had those 600 workers who were owed this amount of money and they were going to be affected adversely. The only way to have done it is if there was some sort of organizational that you could go to an international union, the United Steelworkers, which is the second largest industrial union in, in the country, and tap the resources, the money, the expertise, on and on to be able to handle this case. If the workforce was not organized, this would never have happened. This has been a really fascinating exploration of the many uh, important uh, political, economic, legal uh, issues, priorities uh, for the state of Wisconsin and for the country. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists very much for all of the different perspectives and expertise that you brought to the conversation. Um, and turn it over to Professor Schatzinger to uh, kind of conclude the proceedings and uh, let you know about upcoming events. Let's give the panelists a hand first. Thank you. Yes, I was just about to say uh, thank you very much, uh, panelists. Thank you very much, uh, Soren, for moderating. Uh, I thought it was really, really insightful and uh, quite interesting really talking about the, the interplay, right, uh, between the, um, the industry and the outside players. And also to hear about sort of now how the, the value that loggers can provide. I learned something about that, the, uh, uh, the creativity that was spoken about. And so I want to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, uh, I know this was uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> difficult for some to come uh, tonight uh, because of you know advertising things that have happened, uh, and so uh, I'm glad that we'll have some viewers uh, online as well as uh, on TV. And I want to welcome you back next week, Thursday, 6:30 uh, p.m. Alex Lazary, co-owner of the Milky uh, Bucks, will join us. Uh, he is a candidate um, <clears throat> for the U.S. Senate race and uh, he will uh, talk about his campaign. And uh, in the future, uh, we certainly welcome more candidates uh, to, to come back and, uh, and to share their thoughts. Uh, so I hope you can join us at the same location next week at uh, 6.30. Thank you again, and have a good night.